Oh, God bless you. My name is Samuel Benitez. I'm going to open up a prayer real quick, and then we'll get started with this Bible study. Heavenly Father, coming for you this night, God, I just want to thank you for another day of life, God. Thank you for waking us all up this morning. I thank you, God, for all that you're doing in our lives, God. I thank you for everybody who comes across this uh, Bible study, God. Let it minister to them, God. But um, um, if, 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 if only one person, you know, gets something out of this, God, then this video was more than worth it. That's what I do it for, God. And I just thank you for of this opportunity to lead these Bible studies in this way. And I just once again thank you for all those who come across this video, whether it be now or in the future, God. Um, just minister to them, God, let it always be your words, never mine, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so tonight's Bible study is titled, God Will Make His Will Known. And the first scripture that I want to start off with is Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. And it says, let me see, I've, I've got it up there for you. And it says, you know, I, mean, I think I already started off with a typo and different translations. It says, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you isn't that how you know we feel you know a lot in life you know we don't know what to do so when we don't know what to do we need to have our eyes fixed we need to have our eyes fixed on um on god you know it says we do not know what to do but our eyes are on you when we don't know what to do we need to make sure that our eyes are on god um, and, and no one else nothing else um you know we can all relate to feeling that way in life right you know it says um Oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now, you know, the title is God will make his will known. Now, knowing God's will is, you know, um, an issue for so many of us. You know, we've all we've all been there where we feel like, you know, what is God's will? You know, why is it so difficult? Why is it so why is it a mystery? You know, why I wish God would just make his will known so I don't have to, you know, guess and wonder and, you know, is this it? Is that it? You know, but God will make his will known. Maybe you do know it. Maybe you don't. You know, maybe you, you understand what God's will is for your life or maybe you're confused by it. Sometimes we know and are committed you know, to it. We're like, okay, I know what your will is for me. And, you know, I'm committed to that. I, I have an agreement. I, I agree with you, God, you know, and other times it's complicated and it seems unclear or it's hidden, you know, et cetera, you know, whatever, whatever, um, you know, we, we've all been there. Like sometimes it just seems just, you're not sure what God uh, wants you to do or has for you. It seems unclear, but God's will is not hidden. So why does it seem that way? sometimes you know why does it feel that way sometimes if god's will is not hidden now we're going to go to second uh kings chapter 16 and we're going to be reading through verses uh 30 through 33 and it says and ahab the son of omri did evil in the sight of the lord more than all who were before him verse 31 and if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Esbal, king of the Sidonians. So if it wasn't bad enough, he ended up taking um, for himself a wife named Jezebel um, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. 32, he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. You know, um, what did it say in the first verse there in verse 30? More than all who were before him. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil on the side of the Lord. More than all who were before him. And then in verse 33, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So he did more, you know, he was, he was worse, you know, he did more to anger the Lord than all those who came before him. Now, Ahab was the seventh king in Israel. And because of his wife, Jezebel, she brought Phoenician religion to Israel and allowed 
his wife to kill the prophet. So, you know, that was another issue. If that wasn't enough, he took Jezebel as a wife. So he was the seventh king of Israel. And he uh, he, he led his wife. He took a wife named Jezebel who brought Phoenician religion into Israel. And he allowed her to kill the prophets. So he did he did worse than everyone who came before him. He did he did he did far worse. Um, then we go to Second Chronicles chapter seventeen, and uh, it says seventeen verse three. It says the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David. He did not seek the bells. Verse four but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. And then we go to the next chapter, 2 Chronicles 18, 1, and it says, Now Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor, and he made a marriage alliance with Ahab. Verse 2, After some years he went down to Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed an abundance of sheep and oxen for him, for the people who were with him, and in and um, induced him to go up against Ramoth Gilead. Verse 3, Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? He answered him, I am as you are. My people as your people will be with you in the war. So right there we see, um, we see a very uh, interesting alliance. You know, Ahab, you know, did what was evil on the side of the Lord. And, you know, Jehoshaphat um, was the exact opposite. You know, it says in, in 17, three, it says the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father, David, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. And then in 18, now Jehoshaphat had a great riches great riches and honor and he made a marriage alliance with Ahab you know so he married off one of his children to to Ahab's children he, he forms an alliance with Ahab and these are two very opposite two very opposite men so that stands out right there that doesn't make any sense um why would he do that now uh we go down to second chronicles 18 verses 28 through 34 and we see uh this is where ahab dies okay and i'm, I'm, I'm gonna read these six or seven verses um second chronicles 18 verses 28 through 34 hope you're following along in your bible and it says then the king of israel and judah's king jehoshaphat went up to ramoth gilead but the king of israel which is ahab said to jehoshaphat I will disguise myself and go into battle. But you wear your royal attire. So the king of Israel disguised himself, that's Ahab, and they went into battle. So Ahab is saying, I'm going to disguise myself and go into battle. But he tells Jehoshaphat, you wear your royal attire. Right away, that just sounds very odd. That that just, that, that doesn't sound right at all. Why is he going to disguise himself? And not show that he's a king, but he wants Jehoshaphat to show that he's a king. Verse 30. Now the king of Aram, the opposing king, had ordered his chariot commanders, do not fight with anyone at all except the king of Israel. So the opposing you know, king is telling his men, don't fight with anyone but the king of Israel. And remember, the king of Israel, Ahab, just told Jehoshaphat, you go out there and wear your kingly attire, but I'm going to disguise myself. When the chariot commanders saw Jehoshaphat, verse 31, they shouted, he must be the king of Israel. So they turned to attack him. But Joseph cried out and the Lord helped him. God drew them away from him. Verse 32, when the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Remember, they were told to only fight with the king of Israel, and the king of Israel basically just uh, basically disguised himself so they wouldn't know he was the king, but told Jehoshaphat, you go out there and look like a king, you know, wear your kingly attire. So when they saw Jehoshaphat, 
they assumed he was the king because he was the only one wearing kingly attire. So you see what was going on here. When the chariot commander, verse 32, when the chariot commanders saw that he was not the king of Israel, they turned back from pursuing him. Verse 33, but a man drew his bow without taking special aim and struck the king of Israel through the joints of his armor. So he said to the charioter, turn around and take me out of the battle for I am badly wounded. The battle raged throughout that day and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing armed facing the Armians until evening. Then he died at sunset. So we see that the king of Israel, which is Ahab, um, disguises himself so that he's not recognized in battle, but tells Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, you can wear your kingly. You know, they made, they've made this alliance. You can wear your kingly attire. He's trying to get him killed. He's trying to get Jehoshaphat killed, obviously. Um, and it almost it almost worked. Um, you know, the king of, of Aram told his men only fight with the king of Israel. And when they saw Jehoshaphat, they assumed he was the king of Israel because he was the only one who looked like a king. And But God was with Jehoshaphat and he, he saved him. He spared him from that. And, uh, and then uh, an archer later on taking no special aim actually strikes Ahab and he gets killed, the king of Israel. Now, um, Second Chronicles 19.1 says, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, this is the next chapter, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. So God saved his life, you know, it, came, it was a close call, made the wrong alliance, and he almost got killed for it. Now, Second Chronicles 19.1, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned in safety to his house in Jerusalem. Verse 2, but, the, but Jehu, the son of Hanai, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Verse 3, nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroyed the Asheroth out of the land and have set your heart to seek God and, to set, and has set your heart to seek God. So we see that God spares Jehoshaphat in chapter 18. And then in chapter 19, he comes home to safety, and but he gets rebuked by Jehu, the son of Anai the seer. And he says, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Who's he talking about? Ahab. So why, why are you helping the wicked and, and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroyed the Asherah out of the land and has set your heart to seek God. Now, Jehoshaphat, he got rid of the Asherah poles and he determined to seek God in his heart. So that was the good that was found in him, which why God was, was angry, but he spared him because he found some good in him. Now, I ask you this, what idols need to be removed in your life? You know, an idol is anything that comes before God. You know, yeah, we're not walking around with carved images like, like the Israelites were back in those days and all that stuff. But many things, we, we still have an idolatry problem today in 2022. Anything that comes before God is an idol. So what I, anything, okay? So anything that comes before God is an idol. It can be innocent things that you think are innocent that you put before God. So therefore it's an idol, you know? And too often we're, we, too many believers feel like, oh, it's innocent. It's innocent. No, if it comes before God, if, if you're like, okay, what do I, what do I want to do today? Go. Uh, I'm gonna make. A, I guess some people will say, oh, that's, that's ridiculous, Sam. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this um, example. It's Sunday. Uh, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna go to the Dodger game or am I gonna go to church? Who wins? Who wins? Oh, well, you know, I can go to church every every other Sunday. But you get what I'm saying. You know, I'm not trying to judge. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, I'm using an example. Anything that comes before God is an idol in our lives, you know. You know, are, are, are sports evil? Are sports the devil? You know, like, you know, I think of Ricky, um, water boy, water boy. Yeah, it's the devil. You know, his mom's always, that's the devil. No, it's, the sports are not the devil. But you, I hope you understand what point I'm trying to make. Anything that comes before God is an idol. It can be anything. I just happen to use sports, you know. Um, sports used to be an issue 
uh, well, not an issue, but used to be a huge part of my life. And now sports has no place in my life. Um, but, you know, that's just me, you know. But even when sports was a huge deal in my life, I would miss very important Laker playoff games for, for church. You know, even, you know, I, I remember I was, I was like 18, 19 years old. The Lakers were playing the Spurs in the, in, in the, in the Western Conference playoffs. You know, this is back in the good old days when we had Kobe and Shaq and Rick Fox and Robert Ory and Derek Fisher and Brian Shaw and Ron Harper and, you know, all these, all these, you know, guys from, from my time. Um, because, you know me, I don't, I don't, I don't associate with this era. Um, you, I'm just barely older than, Le, than LeBron, but I just, I just don't associate with this era. So I say my time, you know, like my dad was Magic and Kareem. Well, I'm Kobe and Shaq, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, Robert Ory and Rick Fox and Derek Fisher and Brian Shaw and Ron Harper, you know, Horace Grant, you know, uh, those like those Laker teams. And I remember they were playing the Spurs and they had the Twin Towers. And, and all that stuff with Duncan and Robinson. And I missed a very important playoff game to go to a, a, a youth worship night. And I remember calling my dad on a payphone. Yeah, that's right, a payphone. Um, as it was winding down, and I was going to let him know that I was going to be driving home now because I was still young. I was 18, 19, and, you know, just, you know, newly driving on my own. And I was going to be driving from like Whittier to Southgate. And I was gonna let him know, hey, I'm I'm gonna be on my way soon. I was like, hey, did the Lakers win? And he was like, yeah, they they won. That was that game where where Kobe got that put back. He had the throw, and uh, he got that put back. He went up and he, he he got that offensive rebound over the twin towers, and he put the ball back in and you know crucial moment of the game. So you know, God honored God honored my faithfulness and let the Lakers win that that game. Not really, you know. I mean, God don't care about basketball. You know, that was a coincidence. You know, this is, God doesn't care about all those things. But but anything that comes before God is an idol. So what idols need to be removed in your life? You know, a lot of idols need to be removed in my life. And, uh, you know, so what idols? What idols do we do we need to remove in our lives? You know, going back to Jehoshaphat, it says that, you know, Jehoshaphat got rid of the Asherah poles, and he determined to seek God in his heart, which is, you know, why God found good in him. So what idols need to be removed in your life, you know? And why was why did why did Jehoshaphat make this alliance with Ahab, someone the complete opposite of him? You know, Ahab did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He married Jezebel. She brought Phoenician religion into Israel. She, his wife killed all the prophets. And then you got Jehoshaphat who, 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 you know, was the complete opposite. So why this alliance, you know? Why this alliance? I, I, I love what Je, what Jehu tells him. You know, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? You know, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? You know, you're making an alliance with someone. You're helping the wicked, and you're loving those who hate the Lord. You know, that's that doesn't make any sense. You know, this this, this alliance um, is intriguing. You know, it's like what 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 caused him to make this marriage alliance with Ahab, you know, possibly it was to unite the kingdoms, you know, maybe it was for military strength, a military strategy, you know, maybe it was wealth, who knows. Um, but, you know, why, you know, and he, he, but he failed to depend on God in this alliance and it almost cost him his life because this alliance with Ahab, he almost got killed over it because uh, the, the soldiers mistaked him as the king of Israel. Basically, uh, Ahab set him up. Set him up. That's how I read it. You know, and it almost cost him his life. It almost cost him his life all because he failed to depend on God. He made an alliance he should not have made. What alliances are we making, you know, in this world? You know, and this this alliance that we see Jehoshaphat made almost cost him his life, but he was spared. Now, we go to Second Chronicles again. You know, I started off with Second Chronicles, chapter twenty, verse twelve. Now we're gonna. I'm not. I promise. I'm not gonna read thirty verses. You know, it says one through thirty. But I want to point out some things, um, some highlights that I got in these thirty verses, um, and then and then we'll talk about these. Um, so I'm picking up in verse fifteen. You know, I've got it there for you. So you're, hopefully you're following along in your Bible. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And we're going to be, is 1 through 30, but we're going to pick up in 15. I'm just going to point out some 
some highlights that I took in these verses. It says, and he said, listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the vast number for the battle is not yours, but God's, but God's. Now, now going back to the opening, the opening verse, verse 12, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12 says, Our God will not, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this vast number that comes to fight against us. We do not know what to do, but we look to you. So now in verse 15, it says, This is what the Lord says Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number. This is God's answer. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Okay, let me go down to verse 17. And he says, it says, you do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. So you do not have to fight this battle. Just position yourself and then stand still. And see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. That was verse 17. Then we go down to verse 20. And it says, In the morning they got up early and went out to the wilderness of Tico. As they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. Verse 21, then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. When they went out in front of the armed forces, they kept singing, give thanks to the Lord. For his faithful love endures forever. In verse 22, the moment they began their shouts and praises, the Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Sur, who came to fight against Judah. They were all defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites turned against the inhabitants of Mount Sur and completely annihilated them. When they had finished with the inhabitants of Sur, they helped destroy each other. <laughs> when Verse 24, when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked for the large army, but there were only corpses lying on the ground. Nobody had escaped. So when the moment they began to sing, the moment they began to praise, God turned their enemies against each other. It says that the moment in verse 22, they began their shouts and praises. The Lord set an ambush against the Ammonites, Moabites, and the inhabitants of Mount Sur who came to fight against Judah. They were all defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites, they turned against Mount Sur and they annihilated them. And when they had finished destroying them, they, had, they destroyed each other. And when Judah came out to look for this large army, all they found were corpses. All they found were dead bodies. The battle was done and they didn't have to do anything. What did he say in those verses prior to that? Don't be afraid. The battle is not yours. God refused to allow them to participate in the battle. He refused to allow them to participate in the battle. This required great faith. We see this throughout the Bible, you know, the Old Testament, where God asks them to do something that don't make sense militarily speaking, okay? You know, walk around the walls of Jericho one time each day for six days, and on the seventh day, do it seven times. And he gives them all these specific instructions, and when they followed it to a T, the wall came down. That didn't make sense militarily speaking, right? But that's how God operates. And once again, we see it here. He, 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 just, he tells them, don't be afraid. The battle is not yours. He refuses to allow them to participate in the battle, which required great faith, believe and sing. At the moment they began to praise, we see the connection. The moment they began to sing and praise, that's when God sets an ambush against these this vast army, and they destroy themselves. doesn't make sense, militarily speaking, but that's how God operates, and he just required great faith from them. Now, in Psalms 22, 
verses 3 and 4, it says, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praise of Israel. In your fathers, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praise of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. See, the battle belongs to the Lord. We've all heard that a million times growing up in church, right? The battle belongs to the Lord. God's will is his to communicate and his to fulfill. He will make sure everything falls into place. All we need to do is trust him. All we need to do is obey him in the meantime. It's his right to exclude or include us from the battle. It's his right to include or exclude us from the battle. God knows how to get our attention. He knows how to get our attention. I, I, I talked recently at the, at the ranch about, you know, God will get your intention. God will do whatever it takes. You know, um, you know, I've seen this, you know, in my own life, you know, how God will do whatever it takes to get your attention and how everything is falling into place when you don't even realize it. God is already, God is already working things out and you have no idea what's coming. You have no idea. I had no idea what was coming. And now looking back, you know, 800 plus days later, since my father passed away, I, I'm, I'm still amazed. I was noted. I was realizing it right away after my dad passed away. I was just like, wow, now everything makes so much more sense. Everything is so clear now because now I understand why everything took place in the months leading up, leading up to uh, my dad um, getting diagnosed and then passing away in seven weeks. You know, now everything made sense. Why God was pulling on me when he was, because his plan, he was executing his plan to take my father home. And I needed to be in a position where I was ready for them. And I needed to be in a position where I was back on the thinking clearly and thinking right and had the right intentions and the right desires and all that stuff. And I had no idea. I had no idea why all this was taking place. And then when my dad passed away, it was like, wow, this makes so much more sense now why God uh, took me from where I was and placed me where he, uh, on the road that he wanted me to um, start walking down. And here over 800 days later, you know, you know, here I am still walking down that road, understanding more and more uh, of what God, um, what God was, was doing all along. See, God knows how to get your attention and he got my attention and then he kept my attention um, when my father was diagnosed. And then when my father was passed away, he knew how to get my attention and then he kept my attention and he still has my attention all this time later, you know, going on two and a half years later, he still has my attention. God knows how to get our attention. He will show us one step at a time, which makes it difficult, right? Because we all want to know ahead of time. We want to know, okay, God, you just told me what you want me to do. Now I need you to tell me how it's all going to work out so I can trust this. No, he will let us know one step at a time. He will let us know one step at a time, He, which makes it difficult. He knows how it all ends, but he won't give us the spoilers. He's not going to give us the spoilers. He's going to require that we trust him, that we have faith. But, you know, we're humans and we want to know everything up front. You know, it's like, you know, you get into a car and you're driving on this lonely highway. If you're going to drive from California to New York, um, your headlights are only going to light up, what, like 15 to 20 feet at a time. You're not going to see the whole 2,000 miles, whatever it is. Miles wise, you're not going to see it all at once. If you take off at one in the morning, you're not going to, if you take out broad daylight, you're just still only going to see the next couple miles at a time, you know, but if you're driving at night, your headlights only shine like 15 feet, 20 feet ahead of you. And that's how it is in this life of God. He, he, he shows us one step at a time. 
And that's what makes it difficult because we want to know up front how it's all going to work out. We want to skip to the last chapter. We want the spoilers. We don't want to go through 10 seasons of a show. We want... We want we want to binge watch. We want to binge watch our life. We want to binge watch God's plan, God's will for our lives. We want to binge watch it like that. We want it downloaded instantly so that we can say, oh, okay. And then okay, I, I can do that. And now that I know that it's all gonna work out in the end, you know, sometimes, sometimes if God was to show us everything we were gonna go through in the meantime, we might be like, some people might be like, you know what? I know it all works out in the end, but I don't think I can deal with all that on the way. That's pretty crazy, right? But that's true. A lot of people uh, would, would say, I don't think I can deal with all that on the way, even though it works out in the end. So God only shows us one step at a time. He knows how it all ends, but he won't give us the spoilers. He's not going to ruin it for us. He's going to require that we trust and obey and have faith. He is teaching us to trust him, but our stubbornness only prolongs the process. You know, I, I, we can't go over this enough. You know, all these Bible studies, is if, 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 you're, if you've been going along with me for these past couple of weeks on these Bible studies, you should be noticing a common theme. You know, you should be noticing a, co- a common theme that is uh, going to continue on for a couple more weeks um, um, before I move on to something else. Um, but you should be noticing a common theme in these Bible studies if you are. Um, if you've been following since I since I started going crazy with these and putting these on Facebook and YouTube so much. He is teaching us to, to trust him, but our stubbornness only prolongs the process. We need to stop. We need to get out of our own way because we're just delaying the process. Disobedience in other areas can lead to God, to feeling like God's will is hidden. You know, earlier at the beginning, I said, if if God makes his will known, why does it seem so unclear? Why does it seem hidden? Well, disobedience. If God's will is known, if he will make his will known to us, if it's not hidden, why does it seem like it is? Because of disobedience in other areas of our lives, it can lead to God's uh, will uh, feeling like it's hidden. We can't move forward until there is submission in all areas you know, another tie-in to my last couple Bible studies. Like I said, you should be noticing a common theme as we go through these these Bible studies. I'm not sure what number I'm on of this, but it's going to go on, you know, for another, like, you know, quite a few Bible studies. It's a common theme. Um, We can't move forward until there is submission in all areas, not just, okay, I submit this area, but not this Okay to this, no to that. No, that's not how we're. That's not how we operate. With, and that's not how we should be operating with God. We can't move forward until there's submission in all areas. Sometimes God wants us to engage in the battle, and other times He says, "Watch from the sideline." You know, you, you hear you, you, and that's what we saw in this in uh, chapter um, eighteen. In chapter eighteen, um, twenty-eight to thirty-four. 2 Chronicles 18, 20, 34, we saw that, you know, God was telling them to, or was it 19? Um, I get confused. Um, that, that 28 to 34 was the, I believe that was, uh, where is, um, Ahab set Jehoshaphat up, right? That was where Ahab set Jehoshaphat up. Yeah. Um, but, Sometimes God will have us engage. He'll want us to engage. And sometimes he'll want us to be on the sidelines. What he told them, you don't, but the battle is not yours. The battle is not yours. I'm, I'm going to do this. You know, when they came out to see this great army, they were all dead. God had already taken care of it all. So sometimes, sometimes that's chapter 20, chapter 20. He's bugging me. It's like, I'm talking and it's in my, it's, it's in my, yeah, see, I'm, I'm talking, but there's another conversation going on in my head. And my wife, can't I, can't I, uh, uh, you know, this is bugging me. It's chapter 20, you know, second Chronicles chapter 21 to 30. There we go. See, now I can sleep. I won't, I won't wake up at 2 AM going, ah, you know, it's right there in my notes. Why didn't I see it? You know, sometimes God will want us to engage and other times he will want us to uh, just, you know, ride the sidelines on this one. 
I guess you can say. And you you hear it you hear it in church all the time. You know, don't be a sideline Christian. Of course not. We don't want to be sideline Christians where, you know, we 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 come every Sunday and we just sit in our pew or we sit in our our chair and we we're, we're sideline Christians. We don't get involved. We don't get involved. We don't participate. We don't we don't we don't add anything. We don't offer ourselves. We think that we're doing our part just by showing up and saying an amen here and there, bringing our Bibles, following along, paying our tithes and offering. And we and we feel that's enough. No, everybody has a part to play. You know, so in that sense, we do not want sideline Christians where we just so many of us just come to church and do nothing. Do nothing. You know, it's like you just come in and then you leave, you know, and you don't participate, you don't volunteer your time, you don't get involved in anything, and you honestly feel like that's fine. No, it's not fine. We all have a part to play. We all have a responsibility. You're not going to be asked to get up and do something you're uncomfortable with, but we all have we all have something that we offer. We all have something that we bring to the table, something that that God can use, and we need to allow God to use us in our churches. Um, so in that sense, we do not want to be sideline Christians, but sometimes God wants us to engage, and sometimes he wants us to watch from the sideline. He wants us just to trust him, and that's what we saw in Second Chronicles 20, 1 through 30, where he says, this is what the Lord says, do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And then he says in 17, you do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. Stand still. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out to face them, for the Lord is with you. In verse 20, towards the bottom, verse 20 is a big verse. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. And they sing. They kept singing. Give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. In the moment he, they began to sing their shouts and praises, the Lord set an ambush against their the, the, the Ammonites, Moabites, and Mount Sir who came to fight against Judah. And they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites turned against the inhabitants of Mount Sir and completely annihilated them. When they had finished with the inhabitants of Sir, they helped to destroy each other. Verse 24, when Judah came to a place to overlook, overlooking the wilderness, they looked for the large army, but there were only corpses lying on the ground. Nobody had escaped. So sometimes God just wants you to let him do, let him do his thing and you just, you know, he refused, refused to let them participate in the battle. So in that sense, yes, sometimes God wants us to engage, and sometimes he wants us to ride the sideline and just trust him. But in church, no, God doesn't want sideline Christians. I just want to make that, I just want to make that, um, I just want to make that clear. I'm not, I'm not saying ride the sidelines every Sunday at church. No, we encourage everyone, everyone, and I'm not just talking about my church. I'm talking about all churches. Everyone has a. Everybody should be f fighting over opportunity to be used in the church. No, it's my week to teach Sunday school. No, it's my week. I want to teach them. That's the problem that we should have. We shouldn't be having problems where, oh man, we need more people. We need more people to teach Sunday school. We need more people to work with the toddlers. We need more people to help clean the church. We need more people to you know volunteer for food bank. We need more people um, to. Um, Step out and see and, and let God show them that hey, you can be a teacher as well. You can, you know, lead a Bible study, you can do more than you think. You know, we should be fighting, we should be fighting over God using us. And here I go again, kind of getting off track, only because I want to make that point clear. I don't want nobody to think that I'm saying it's okay to be a sideline Christian in the in the church. We all have a role to play and we all have a responsibility. We should all um be be stumbling over each other to to help but in this particular bible study in this story we see that god did not want them to participate the battle is not yours and he took care of it all sometimes we just need to get out of our own way and let god be god and do his thing and, and let him just take care of it all and understand that sometimes god will make his will known he wants us to engage and other times he'll make his will known 
you know, just sit this one out. I, I, I can't really think of another way to put it. Sit this one out and let me take care of this. Either way you look at it, he will make his will known. Now, in closing, God knows where we are, okay? God knows where we are. He knows where we are. Romans 8, 29 and 30 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the first mourn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And then in closing, God is committed to help us live out his plan for us. God is committed to help us live out his plan for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know a very famous scripture. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and 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 come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. That was Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. But don't forget, there is a process, okay? We've got to be fair with the scriptures. You know, we all use this, this scriptures on T-shirts, coffee mugs, bumper stickers, you know. And, oh, yeah, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, you know, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Praise God. But we leave out, you know, the verses before that and the 70 years and, you know, the process. OK, so we're talking about the process. Nobody wants the process. We want to skip the process and just get right to this future and hope, you know, uh, with these great plans. But there is a process. So read when you read Jeremiah 29, 11, read the verses before it. Read start at verse one, you know, uh, but you know me. I'm lazy when it comes to the copy and pasting. Um, so, you know, I put that, but I'm saying it. I'm saying it. We've got to be fair with the scriptures. So let me read this famous scripture that everyone loves. Don't leave out verses 1 through 10, okay? Understand that there is a process to get to these this future, and I hope you don't, you don't snap your fingers and get to the future. So um, God will make his will known. God will make his will known. Um, you know, that's the title of tonight's Bible study. God will make his will. God will make his will known. It is sometimes it 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 seems it seems like uh like it's hidden, like it's just not clear. And you know, disobedience, you know, disobedience in other areas of our life is what leads us to feel that way. So we need to examine ourselves daily and see, you know, God, I do this all the time. You know, I do this all the time. I'm I just can't say it enough. I do this all the time. God, show me where where I'm still coming up short. Show me where, you know, and it's usually pretty obvious. It's usually pretty obvious. I can see the 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 transformation. It's, it's night and day, you know, uh, how I was and how I am now. But still, where where I come up short, it's obvious. I, it's not like, it's not like, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't know, God. What, what am I doing wrong? No, I, it's, it's it's obvious. You know, I still have you know my my uh, what's it called my attitude and all that stuff. And you know, I have to really catch myself. You know, catch myself with things that would normally set me off. And you know, and um, driving coworkers, just people in general. You know, pushing your buttons. You know, so. It's it's obvious. It's, it can be obvious. So dis, disobedience in other areas can of our life can lead us to to feeling that God's will is hidden, but it's not hidden. It's clear. Uh, we just need to examine ourselves daily. And you know, God, where where am I coming up short? Where how can I, show me where I can do better? And you know, and can catch ourselves like ah, you know, shoot, I shouldn't have shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have reacted that way. You know, and, you know like, like I said before, sometimes. When my buttons are being pushed in whatever situation, I've I've had to literally go and um I'll I, I'll be on I like to be honest and, and let let people in and because you never know someone may need to hear this you know when I posted that on Facebook the other day for you know, my Facebook friends about practicing what I preach um 
I went to my car on my break and read for 15 minutes for my devotionals. Um, I have one in my car, one at home, devote men's devotion books. And I had that one in my car. It wasn't just because I was practicing what I preach and, you know, spending my free time um, reading God's word, but it was because my, I felt the flesh, you know, I felt the flesh, um, you know, rising up in me at work, at work. And I, ta I talked about it in my last Bible study. I talk about it throughout, you know, we're not perfect people. And one of my biggest issues was my temper. Never start nothing, but I'm always ready when someone tries to start something with me. And, you know, I just, you know, attitudes and just pushing buttons and hard looks. And it's like, it's like, God, you know, <laughs> you know, what's going on? Why, why are these, why are these, some of these guys looking for trouble with me? It seems like, and, and I, I literally, I, there's no reason for it. Just, you know, hard looks like, like I said last time, you know, some people don't like you. Some guys don't like me because I don't speak the language. I don't speak Spanish and they think I'm a disgrace. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't realize my mom is as white as white gets. And that's why we should never judge a book by its cover. You know, I can't tell you how many times but I've had, I have to deal with so much nonsense attitude just because I don't speak Spanish and people literally pointed to my skin color. Like I'm, that's why they thought it. It's like, well, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. My mom is as white as white gets. That's why you do not assume. Assumption is the lowest form of knowledge. And so many people just assume. So, it's like, so that's one issue that I deal with. You know, mo it's just a, it's just a, a small percentage of, of guys at work who seem to not like me for whatever reason. But I, I just, I just keep, you know. I keep, and it was funny is, you know, I wear my, my, my Christian shirts. I wear my Christian hats, scripture, you know, and all the stuff. And they, 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 that means something, right? They see that. But these, some of these guys just say, like, what's going through your mind? It's like, they're, they're, they're looking for trouble, you know? So I'm always having to like, you know, like, you know, breathe, you know? And so that day when I posted that a few days ago, I, I, that was, that was what main reason why was because, attitudes were, were were flying and again it's no words it's all just you know like a look and they drive off on their forklift because like i joked last time they're not really about that life they're just you know pretending you know they're pretenders and um so i literally i i said it's time for a break you know because i'm very just in my own world at work just zooming around just you know just back i i don't i don't talk much i just certain people here and there, you know, but I'm not like a gabber, you know, I'm just working. And um, I was like, yeah, it's time for break. I went straight to my car. I didn't sit in the break room. I didn't straight to my car. And I read, I read because, you know, I needed to, you know, clear my mind because the, the, the enemy was, was, was on some forklifts inside that warehouse the other day. So uh, once again, you know, I'm famous for going off on a little bit of a tangent, something, something triggers. And I, have an example, but God's will, God will will make his will known. God will make his will known and disobedience in other areas of our life will lead us to feeling like it's hidden. So we must examine ourselves daily and, you know, um, we're never going to be perfect, but we, we strive to be, we, that's our aim, but we understand that we won't be perfect till we make it to heaven and just examine yourselves daily and uh, ask God to, uh, you know, show you where, where you're coming up short, where you're lacking and, you know, work on those things. And, you know, God's will will become so much more clear, you know, as we do this. So I um, hope this uh, Bible study ministered to you, ministered to someone. Thank you for watching. Uh, appreciate you guys. I'll see you next time.